Good morning, everyone. So we're going to begin our study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study time we have this morning together, for this new week. And we invite your spirit to instruct and teach us as we look at the things in the book of Judges that we don't understand. We ask, Lord, that your spirit can uh, use us to reach others. Help us, Lord, to trust in you and not in man. Um, we don't want to lean on to our own understanding, Lord, but upon your Holy Spirit that inspired the scriptures. We ask for light for our, our feet at the present time. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so I've been struggling over Judges chapter 5, uh, verses 14 to 31, the last couple of days. And I don't know if I'm any further along, um, even though I've done a lot of work. But uh, we're going to look at these again, these verses, because we want to, to try to finish this line, if we can, if this, if this makes sense as a line. Um, now, this, of course, is the song of Deborah Barak. And with the first part, uh, verses 1 to 13, we could put them in a line. And that line made a lot of sense. Um, but as we start to look at these other verses, verse 14 onward, they become a little more problematic as a line, at least for me personally. So <clears throat> what we had done is we had looked at these different tribes. And, and we looked at the numbers and we saw all of these symbols that this movement used um, in that July 18, 2020 prediction. Uh, in that period of 777 days. So we have all these symbols that tie us to that. Um, but then we get to verse 14. And um, when we get to verse 14, we're still going to have uh, these tribes mentioned. But it's going to, um, where is it here? No, it's not verse 14, pardon me. Uh, verse 18. So in verse 18, we're going to have Zebulun and Naphtali out of all these tribes. These are the ones mentioned last, and these are the ones that actually uh, join in this battle um, with uh, um, the name escapes, escapes me. Um, uh, Barak, right? So they join in the battle with Barak. And um, and it's of these, of all these tribes, Zebulun and Naphtali were the people that jeopardied their lives unto the death in the high places of the field. And then it gives us this place where this battle is fought. The kings came and fought, then fought the kings of Canaan in Tanakh by the waters of Megiddo. Now this phrase, Tanakh, so we're just going to look at this here again. So this phrase, Tanakh, in the Strong's Concordance, uh, we can see that this word is used in Joshua 12.21, Joshua 17.11, and Judges 1.27, and, and, uh, um, and also Joshua 21.25. So there's three places in the book of Joshua, spelt differently in Joshua 21.25 to 25, uh, but it's the same place, uh, just a different spelling. And um, we can see if we look at this other word, Megiddo, which we didn't really look at, but Megiddo is used in a Joshua 12, 21, Joshua 17, 11, and Judges 1, 27. It's not used in uh, Joshua uh, 21, 25 as um, uh, the other word is. So it's, it's just not used there. Um, and, and here it's, it's either Megiddo or Megiddon. Um, so it's, it's kind of interesting. It's also Judges, of course, 519, because it's going to use both of these. And then there's some other verses. Now, Megiddo is used 11 times 
plus one, 12, right? So we got 12 there all, to, all together. And um, Tanakh is used six times plus one. So that's seven occurrences, right? So just the two different spellings. Um, so both of these have that sort of division with the spelling part of it. Now, of course, seven times 12 is 84. That's on the 1843 chart. Six and one, that reminds us of the weekly Sabbath cycle. And, um, and then we have, uh, with Megiddo, we have this 11 and one. So we get this 111 symbol that we used in um, the first part of Judges. So I don't know what that means particularly, but that's what we have. And um, this helps place this at this point in the line that we call the time of the end. That is, that's where we place this first way mark as being December 25th, 2021. And so we're saying that the darkness here that's being addressed has to do with the repeat of history within this movement. We come to the 777 structure, we come to the end of it, uh, the whole chiasm, which began on um, uh, the Mayan calendar date, 13.0000, uh, all the way to December 25th, 2021. And that's going to be uh, 3,291 days, right? So we looked at that and the, the significance of that uh, related to the Levitical chiasm the 329 days from October 13th to September 7th. So, so these all just become part of some sort of structure. Now we're saying then that, that this part of the song of Deborah and Barak is going to relate to this movement since December 25th, 2021, right? That that's the conclusion. This seems fairly solid. We have Tanakh seven times, so we have this symbol of the seven times. Joshua 12, 21. 12 times 21 is 252. Um, so the 2520 symbol. Joshua 17, 11. 17 times 11 is 187. Joshua 21, 25. 21 times 25 is 525, right? So that gives us all of that information regarding the 777 structure on July 18. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Um, and then, of course, we have Judges 1, verse 27, that gives us a symbol that points to December 25th, 2021. So that's why we place that there. <clears throat> Any questions about this so far, this quick review? Not for me. Okay. So, so then we have, of course, an increase of knowledge. And um, so we need to know what that message is. Now, we're saying that, you know, Stephen's recognition of the 777 years from 457 to 321 is part of that, right? So we think that that's important. Um that it's, it's an affirmation of our 777 structure. And then we know that Collins' study um, gives us uh, an, an, a message. There's a message there attached to Collins' study. Um, but I think there's something more that happens on December 25th, 2021, that we have to look at as the specific message. And, and that would have to be what happened on December 25th, 2021. So the question is, what happened that related to the period of darkness? It relates to the period of darkness, a message that addresses the darkness that occurs in the movement. So we need to know what that darkness is and what happened on December 25th, 2021 that relates to that. So we have this, this conflict, this battle that goes on, right? 
with within uh, this context of of the people of God, right? That's why all these tribes are mentioned, these different characters and personalities. Some join with the message of Barak. Some do not, right? You have Zebulun and Naphtali that do. And, and the characters of these different tribes are, they're part of this message, but they don't join in this battle. So, so what happened on December 25th, 2021? Do people understand what I'm asking or not understand it? Let's review December 25th, 2021. Okay. So what do you want to review about it? What happened? Yeah. Okay. So first thing, there was an invitation that was made, and we've addressed this before and in other lines. So we were coming to the end of our line. So this movement, just like November 9th, 2019, we should have been coming together at that time, right? Because we have this date on our lines. But there is almost no acknowledgement in the movement that we should even have any significance about this date, that we shouldn't be coming together. So, so I made a suggestion that, you know, we should all kind of come together. We need to figure out how to have a meeting together uh, where we can incorporate uh, all of the different groups. Right. So that was the invitation that was made. And of course, that was rebuffed. Right. It was rejected. The, the idea that we somehow could uh, work together on this um, was just not accepted. There was no way that was going to happen. And um, so, so we wanted to have a meeting where we were incorporating incorporating people from other parts of the world. We had a meeting in Spanish that was translated. Uh, we had a meeting in Vietnamese that was translated. Uh, we did a special time for people in other parts of the world. And, um, you know, and it was fairly taxing for me because it was a lot of energy, you know, doing all these meetings and, and the stress of it. Um, so I had to have a quick nap after the morning meeting that we had so that when I got to call and study, um, I came late. You know, I just needed 45 minutes or an hour or whatever just to, to nap so that I could be fresh enough uh, to actually think clearly. And usually those work pretty good, and it did in this case. Um, and when I got to the study on December 25th, I mean, we know that Stephen had presented uh, in the WhatsApp that this 777 years, uh, so this had been discussed a little bit um, uh, in some of our studies, I think. I, I can't, I'd have to go watch all of the, the videos because I don't remember everything clearly. But when I came to Colin's study, he was presenting something that I saw as significant. But he had, uh, there was a resistance there, some in the American group and some in the Canadian group, but were sort of not understanding what Colin was saying. And, and I understood quite well what he was getting at, even though I came in late. Um, I could see the logic of it, and also that there was something that we needed to see about this. Um, though I was questioning, um, the idea that Trump needs to be Alexander the Great, right? That still to me had never made sense, even when Jeff presented it. And I talked to Jeff about it on two occasions. Um, just because it seems inconsistent, you know, with how we understand prophecy. That is, we look at the original application of a prophecy, and from that, we draw the pattern in how we are going to interpret that or apply it in our time, correct? That's how we've always done it. Right? Is correct. that how, right? So yeah, so we always look at its original application. 
And from that, we can then see how it applies now. And um, that is, we don't um, have prophecies, you know, we don't reject the fulfillment of a prophecy and say, well, that prophecy, you know, it had some fulfillment, but the real fulfillment is now, right? You know, that's what people do with the trumpets and things like that. The thing I've liked about this movement is we accept uh, the prophetic fulfillment of these prophecies. They were fulfilled. We're not looking for a, uh, that they weren't really fulfilled then, but now they're going to be fulfilled in this way. So um, we just look at an ap application in that history in connection with a, this prophecy will be repeated. That is, these events in the past become types. And so I couldn't see the consistency of having Xerxes also to be representative of, because he's representative of Trump, that you're going to have Alexander the Great also represent Trump. That just didn't seem to make sense to me and still doesn't. But anyway, there was still stuff there that I thought needed to be understood. But what really happened there was um, something else that I think is a darkness in this movement. And that is how, how the group responded to actually wanting to study God's word. Right. Because here we had an opportunity to study. Now, the suggestion was we need to let Colin finish his study and not interrupt him. Now, what's the problem with that? So no questions asked gives um, the impression that uh, you agree. How's that? Well, I don't know. The thing is, lots of people were asking questions and disagreeing with Colin. Right? Well, yeah. The, right? Big, the larger problem was that there were those that assumed that your tone being used was not respectful and they felt that you were attacking Colin when in fact you were doing nothing more than asking a question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely, I, I, I never understand this thing about tone though um, because I don't think there was anything in my tone until people started to tell me to not talk. Well, and then, and then you're starting to have to talk over people, so you have to speak a little bit louder, right, to try to be heard, which maybe I shouldn't have done. I should have been more patient. Um, but, Theodore, you've come a long way. And in these situations, the, the problem has been that we've gotten a lot of people that have become connected with the movement that have been enamored with their own intelligence. Amen. Now, well, I don't, I, I don't know how to tell that somebody's enamored with their own intelligence. I mean, I can't really say that that's the case. Um, um, well, somebody like me, it's kind of obvious. And I mean, we, We've had a lot of people that come to a point and they want their point heard regardless of the point that other people are trying to make. Well, I understand people wanting their point heard. Everybody wants to be heard. Uh, but it's also important to listen to what other people have to say. Um, you know, to me, that's actually the most important thing. That's, that's that's the frustration I always have is I like to share things, but I want them to be challenged. I want people, you know, Stephen does this to me all the time, um, you know, not necessarily always publicly, but sometimes. But, you know, he'll send me messages in the WhatsApp group, you know, bringing a counter argument to something that I've made some point of 
chronology or something. Now, now part of it is I think he wants to understand it thoroughly. But some people could get quite offended by that. Like, why don't you just accept what I said? Right? That's sort of how. Uh, how can you accept something that you really don't understand? Yeah. Now, the thing is, you, I may say something and I have all of the reasons in the world why what I'm saying is correct. But I do not expect you to accept it just because I said it's correct. Now, I As may not. Well, you shouldn't. And I don't give all of the reasons for a point. Right. Especially in the area of chronology, some of these things are very involved. There's lots of different issues that are tied together. And when I present, I have to present them in a simplified way, right? Otherwise, you'd have to do all the research that I did. But I try to simplify it and bring out the main points that people can see so that they can see what the problems are, right? Um, but there's still always things that we're going to miss, right? So, so, so the issue here, just getting focusing back on December 25th, is that we have an approach to how is this movement going to resolve our disappointment? And, and we had that with December 6th, 2020 declaration. They resolved it by just rejecting all of the chron chronological symbolism, which of course completely undermined everything Jeff taught. So they basically have to reject Jeff's message. They're not going to do that all at once, but ultimately that's what they had to do, right? You, you, couldn't, you couldn't reject the symbolic use of dates and accept Jeff's message. And not so without course, figuring out cause to effect. Right. So you have to go back, and really what you have to do is you have to go back and reject Christianity, right? You have to reject all of the time prophecies, including the ones that pointed to Christ. You have to reject Christ, the, the disappointment of the disciples, because it's paralleled with the disappointment of the Millerites, right? And you have to actually reject the time setting of the Millerites. <clears throat> so, so there's this huge problem they have. But still in this movement continues ideas of Parminder, but, but other ideas, ideas that come from Adventism an approach to uh, how we deal with those who we differ, right? How does the, how did the church deal with us? And are we going to deal with each other just as bad or even sometimes worse than the church dealt with us? You know, so that becomes a huge issue. And so I think in December 25th, 2021, even though there are some events that happened previously, you know, with, the American group and the Canadian group, on December 25th, 2021, there becomes this clear, distinct mark in which we have to, we come face to face with a message of how we deal with understanding truth. Now, Colin in his study continued to talk about Miller's rules, but my contention, and I think the thing that offended uh, Colin a lot was I argued that he wasn't using Miller's rules and I don't think he liked that so you know I I know he didn't like it um, and but Miller's rules are quite quite specific and and especially the most important rule what's the most important one that Miller brings out Uh, the faith thing. Yeah, yeah. And it, so it addresses the idea of you must have faith, which of course really means obedience, right, in that context. Um, so he says the most important rule of all is that you must have faith. It must be a faith that requires a sacrifice. And if tried, would give up the dearest object on earth, the world, and all its desires character, living occupation, friends, home, comforts, and worldly honors. And if any of these should hinder our believing any part of God's word, 
it would show our faith to be vain. Nor can we ever believe so long as one of these motives lies lurking in our hearts. We must believe that God will never forfeit his word. And we can have confidence that he takes notice of the sparrow and numbers the hairs of our head, will guard the translation of his own word and throw a barrier around it and prevent those who sincerely trust in God and put implicit confidence in his word far from erring uh, from erring from the far from the truth though they may not understand hebrew or greek so he's not saying that you shouldn't understand hebrew or greek but god can trust us he can guide us he can direct us now colin actually is the one who really presents this right colin is is arguing for that we must have faith and you can see this in his studies right but the faith that he's asking for, in, in my view, this is my view, is that he's asking us to trust in him. Yep. That could be quite offensive, right? So I have to be trust, careful. Trust there. his feelings. Right. Because he has this strong conviction that something is true. But I know that it has to that be based on make it God's true. Yeah. That it has to be based upon God's word and what God is showing us. So, so then what um, uh, Miller says, he says, these are some of the most important rules, which I find the word of God warrants me to adopt and follow. So he's, he's given rule 14, uh, but he's going to then expand upon it. That is, in, encapsulated in rule 14 is this idea, um, he says, the divinity taught in our school is always founded on some sectarian creed it may do to take a blank mind and press it with it with this kind but it will always end in bigotry a free mind will never be satisfied with the views of others right so when right. We god's word as the arbiter of all truth it doesn't matter whether it's me or colin or jeff or the doctrinal analysis group or whatever that decides that something is true or a declaration made by FFA, what is true or what is not true, that doesn't really matter. And so that means that the onus is placed upon each of us individually to decide what is truth based upon God's word. And of course, this requires character, right? To understand the Bible the Holy Spirit is the one that gives the understanding of it, the same one that, that wrote it. And um, if we have any of these character uh, traits, motives is what um, Miller calls them, lurking in our hearts, we, we can have a major problem in understanding God's word. Now, when people shut down others, and, and, I, and I don't think that Colin really did that personally. I mean, he wasn't the one who wanted me shut down. The, the mistake that he made, if, and I've told him this, is that he should have stood up for me in questioning him. Right? He should have, he should have said, look, this is not a problem. You know, we, we need to look at these things. We need to examine these things. These are fair questions, you know, but that didn't happen, right? So, so that's where I fault him um, in that he didn't stand up. And he's had other opportunities to do the same thing at other times, and, and he didn't. So, and it's not just about me personally. It's about what I was doing because what I was doing was totally valid, even if I was wrong in my view or my opinion. In asking those questions, that was a completely valid uh, approach in a Bible study. And, and the idea then that, that we have, or the, the darkness that we have, is people who want to follow man. So this is, you know, me maybe stepping on people's toes. But I don't think that we can afford to follow anyone. Right. 
that that what's being described here in right. this we part of judges follow anyone. Yeah. So in this last part of judges, what's being shown here is that that we need to be able to to understand these lines for ourselves. Now, now I've been leading out in these studies, you know, for quite a long time. Um, Dwight led out for a while in these studies of understanding the lines because, uh, you know, he was using um, his notes, right, going through that. But, you know, we've been going through it together. But mostly I've been leading out. And and mostly I've been leading out in in some of the, the ideas that we had that we've examined. I mean, it was my idea that Judges 2 verse uh, 1 to 23 represents 9-11 to 2023. And, um, and we could see that that bears out, you know, as we went through uh, the book of Judges, we could see how that history applied. And, and we, I've dealt with these other lines. But when it comes to this line here, I don't think that this line, that I have light on it, other than where we have this starting point, because I've, I've struggled with it. And, and we need to figure this out um, because we come to this point, we know that here, the evidence shows that this points to December 25th, 2021, but it refers to a battle that we are presently in. Now, you know, I have ideas about the line, you know, right from the beginning, what what these these way marks are. Um, you know, and I put April fifth, twenty thirty at the end. Whether that's correct or not, we don't know. But we need to be following. We can't just arbitrarily put together a line. We need to figure out what this is. So um, so now, when we go back to the text. When it says they fought from heaven, the stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Um, this is referring back to the past, Sisera being the message of Parminder. And the stars in their courses is the chronology. Um, but also they fought from heaven. So this is um, a reference to what? I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that. Would you say? They fought from heaven. What is this referencing in our lines? Okay, well, it's, it's chronology. But if we think of the mighty angel of Revelation 18 coming down, we place it at 9-11, right? But we know 9-11 and 11-9 are the same way mark. So can we say that what came and fought against Parmis Parminder's message was a message from heaven, that this was Christ? Yeah. Okay. And it, it wasn't was from the movement. It was from the creator. Yeah. And, and the river, river Kaishan swept them away, that ancient river, the river Kaishan. O my soul, thou hast trodden down strength. So we know... Uh, that this Kaishan River is, it means winding. Um, and, and we looked at where this river is mentioned. Um, you know, it's in Judges 4.7, Judges 4.13, and Judges 5.21, right? So this is where it's first mentioned, is in this story. It's also mentioned in 1 Kings 18.40 um, um, in dealing with uh, Elijah and the prophets of Baal, right, where they slew the false prophets, right? Now, we have 1840 there, and 1840 reminds us of August 11th, 1840, right? So... So one of the things that I think that we can look at is if we look back at this story, they fought from heaven. So this is 11.9. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. Would the river Kaishan be 
um, July 18th. That premise again, what? Okay, and any more thoughts on that? I, I didn't really understand what you said there. Okay, so the river Kaishan sweeps them away. And Kaishan, the, the other places besides judges, is it's in oh, first oh yeah, you could 1840. Say this yeah, so you got 1840. So 1840 brings us to July 18th. And in, in the sense that did Jeff compare uh, the story of Elijah as a contrast with, with this with July 18th, did he connect the two? I seem to recall that. Right. So he he said November 9th was Parminder's group. They're the false prophets. And then July 18th would be uh, Elijah, right? And fire is going to come down from heaven, and that's going to be Nashville, right? That's how Jeff applied it, right? And this is the slaying of those false prophets, in 1 Kings 1840. And we know 1840 refers to August 11th, 1840. So, so this is a review. So it talks about this battle that happens on December 25th, 2021. But it's going to refer to November 9th, 2019, and July 18, 2020. Right? And that, that comes with the symbolism of Tanakh and Megiddo where we get these verses in Joshua uh, that give us these symbols for 252, July 18, and uh, 525, right? So it's going to give us these, these spans of time that we're relating to these different events. So this is a reiteration of history. It's going to refer back to on December 25th, 2021, this battle, it's going to refer back to this whole 777 structure, starting with November 9th against Sisera, and then the river Kaishan, that's Elijah's killing the false prophets um, at Mount, Mount Carmel, or the false yeah, the prophets, I guess you would call them, the, the priests or whatever of Baal. Right, but representing false prophets. Does that make sense? That would look to be a good point. Okay. So all this that I just shared, I never noticed until we just started sharing it because I'd been struggling with these verses. And, um, so it makes the most sense to me right now. And then it, then it says, then were the horse hoofs, horse hoofs, broken by the means of the prancings. And the prancings are the gate, or the, and a gate is understood by the rhythmic pattern, right? The prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. So, so what is this, the horse hoofs? broken by the means of the prancings. Yeah, so we also have Psalm uh, 83, verse 9. Um, so that Kaishan is also mentioned there. Um, so Angela just put a note in there. And do unto them as unto the Midianites, as to Sisera, as to Jabin at the brook of Kaishan, which perished at Endor. They became the dung for the earth, as dung for the earth. Now, um, we, we talked about this before, that this reference here, it's referencing the Midianites. So it, it's, it's referencing all these different enemies that have been defeated. Right. And then it's going to mention Sisera as to Jaden at the brook Kaishan, which perished, which perished at Endor. Now, uh, 
So the reference here then, I'm trying to understand, um, and or of course that Saul's ultimate apostasy too. Spiritualism, tyranny, self-exaltation is defeated, right? So that's included in there. So we can see the problem then that is occurring in this line. The problem is our characters, right? That's what's being addressed on December 25th, 2021. Are we going to become Christ-like in our approach of studying God's word? We look at this past, the conflicts that happened with Sisera. But this is typifying what's going to be happening in the movement. That is, this point has to be addressed in each one of us in order to move forward. Right. Now, in looking at Judges 520 to 22. Yeah. From what from what I've read before, Judges 520 has an alternate Hebrew reading. Okay. Which would, which would be they fought from heaven, the stars in their paths fought against Sisera. Now, in the past, how have we applied stars? Well, they can refer to angels. Okay, and angels can also be referred to as the sons of God, right? Yeah. Right. Okay, so is this giving a kind of a cross-reference to when the sons of God fought against our adversary. And yeah, so this, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so this, is, this is the great controversy. Right. That's it. Yeah. So now, how does the river Kaishan, that ancient river, the river Kaishan, apply in the great controversy? Um, no, you know that verse. That verse reminds me of um, where Michael and his angels fought against Satan and his angels in Revelation, I think, twelve. <clears throat> That's what my mind went to when you was reading that verse. Angels being messages. That's a possibility too. But how does Kaishan apply in the great controversy? I haven't really gone through the controversy with the 187 in mind, but um, I would say that it has to play a pivotal role. Well, I'm trying to get to this because of Theodore's question. Because in 522, there is another alternate Hebrew reading. So the, the verse initially would read, then were the horse hooves broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. And the alternate would replace prancings with tramplings. So in this with the great controversy, are these horse hooves the trampling down of the understanding that's given by Miller's rules? So I'm um, having the question if Sisera is an example of our adversary but is this also an adversary now of the messages of Parminder and Tess is that an example of that okay. 
Now it's an interesting thought from the from the chat as well. So how can we apply these these verses? Because from Judges five nineteen to five twenty three, we have the sixth of the eight stanzas. Am I wrong in what I'm what I'm looking at? Um, is, is this application? I'm trying, it, I'm trying to figure it out. Okay. Um, to me, to me, it, it sounds. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I don't. I don't know if I understand what's happening in the verse. Um, Yeah, so I don't know if I have a good answer. What do horse? What are horses supposed to represent according to Miller's rules? Well, they meant represent Islam. So, uh, I mean, to me here, we have, um, you know, we have, we have the horses represent Islam. We would say that that's the main application that we've made with horses. Now they're broken, that Hebrew word there um, means to stamp, conquer, conquer, disband, to hammer, right? To smite with, with a, the hammer. We know that uh, that happens when, the, when JL uh, puts the spike through the head of Sisera, right? So that sort of could be uh, a reference there. Um, But when it comes to the prancings, right? So I look at this as like the Hebrew word is dahahar, right? So it's actually describing a, a rhythmic beat, right? A pattern. And um, the prancings of the mighty ones, that is an angel, a bull, chiefest, it's the word of ear, a stout, strong, valiant. Um, so, so the question is, you know, it says by means of the prancings, right? So uh, that word there with the prancings, right? Because it's just the word mim added uh, to this word in, in Hebrew. Um, when we look at it, it's just, uh, I'm just going to see if they have it as a separate word or not. Um, yeah, so they just put the mem at the beginning of the word, right? So with the prancings, the prancings of the mighty ones. Um, so so it, it could mean from the prancings. Uh, I guess by means of, that's possible. Um 
Um, so I'm trying to understand what this means. What does it mean? Then were the horse, horse hooves broken by the prancings, uh, from the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. Yeah, so what Angela's saying there is that, because um, what I see here is that this failure of July, it's talking about the failure of July 18, 2020 prediction. Um, but when it talks here about the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones, to me, this must refer to the lines, to the chronological lines. Um, and specifically in relationship to July 18th, being on the line of failed predictions. But that's just my instinct. I don't know if... Um, because this idea of striking down, this word halam, uh, means to strike down by implication, to hammer, stamp, conquer, to span, beat down, break down, overcome, smite with the hammer. But, but to me here, uh, what happened with July... 18th is if we look at this as a message of Cicero and we look at the situation of the movement thinking that they're going to be vindicated um, it is the lines that show that we're not going to be vindicated and the question is are we still are we going to learn the lessons of July 18 because the one group says the lessons of July 18 was we were wrong you know, we should never have set any dates. We shouldn't have used symbolic use of dates. We were wrong in doing that. But now we have another group that continues to want to set dates. They say they're not, but really they are, right? They're looking at these lines. They're setting a time limit in which things are going to occur. And, but that's not really the lesson that we needed to learn. Whether they'll admit it or not. So the lesson that we needed to learn, which I still think that we haven't learned, is that um, we don't have the character needed uh, to do the work that we're professing that we're supposed to be doing. Amen. Right? So, so when it talks about by means of the prancings, the prancing of their mighty ones, this is where I have a problem with this word uh, mighty one, that is... Um, so in, in the Hebrew, it just has uh, this word as abiron, uh, uh, right? So it's it's giving a, a form of this word. It's not just abir, right? So it's it's a plural form. Um, but what is it referring to, like? Um, as far as mighty, right? Um, I guess part of what we look at when we look at it talks about goals. Um, what's that? Angela, you said something? Is it you? Who said something? I'm not sure if it was intentional. Okay. Wasn't me. I think somebody had his mic on or her mic on. Okay. That was me. My wife was talking in the background. Okay. 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 To to go back to this for just a second. Yeah. What you had could I'll go ahead. If we were if we're doing what we're supposed to do in comparing <clears throat> scripture with scripture. Yeah. If we take a look at Proverbs 2131. Okay. Uh, so Proverbs 2131. And what word are we looking at? It'll become evident very quickly. The horse is prepared against the day of battle, but safety is of the Lord. Now, if we then compare that with Psalms 20, verse 7. <clears throat> Psalms 20, verse 7. 
Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And then lastly, Jeremiah 8, 6. Um, so August 6th, I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, what have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rushes, rusheth to the battle. Right. Now, that's just three verses dealing with this with horses. Yeah. Now... I'm not going to disagree that we've had a primary application of this being with Islam. Yeah. But with these verses that we've just read, is this also not supportive of the portions in the very late section of the book of Judges where every man did according to his own understanding? Yeah. Now, I mean, now we also have here, I mean, it's horse hooves, um, which in in this context is horse's heels, right? Right. Um, and of course, that reminds us of Genesis 3.15, as well as uh, uh, the heel where um, Jacob holds on to Esau's heel. Um, so those are but the first reference is Genesis 3.15 to the idea of the heel this is a heel of a horse so this is trusting in uh, not the heel of Christ but the heel of man right but I guess I still get caught up on this word uh, prancings right so this is the only place it shows up um and then we also have uh, the word mighty ones, which I was looking up, and we have some different verses that address that. Um, uh, we have Daniel 11.3 that refers to mighty, but that's, that's different. Um A mighty king, right? So that's just a different word that will stand up. Um, so in, that's in, in this situation with prancings only occurring in Judges five twenty two, and the fact that it's occurring twice. Yeah. What should we make of this? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't have an answer to that. That's what I'm trying to do is trying to figure out what it means. But it, it has to do with patterns. Right? That's that's the way that I look at that. That um and and it's broken. See, see part of the thing here with uh with 522, then where the horse his heels broken by the means of the prancings, the prancings of their mighty ones. And I don't know what this means. That's like, what does it mean the horse hoofs were broken? Um, was it means that they're, because it could mean um, their horse hooves were broken because of the pattern of their gallop. But I just don't, I don't understand I just don't understand what it's what this verse is saying. That's, I guess, my main problem. Okay. Well, now, we're looking at Hebrew 17.26, right? Yeah. And if you, if you hover over the 17.26 in verse 522, yeah. it directs us back to Hebrew 17.25. Okay. Right. So it says, 
uh, a reduplication from 1725. So 1725, uh, which is in Nah Nahum 3.2, the noise of the whip, the noise of the rattling of the wheels, and of the prancing horses, and of the jumping chariots. Um, and this verse here in the context, it's a woe to Nineveh, the bloody city. The horseman lifteth up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there's a multitude of slain, a great number of carcasses. There's none end of their corpses. They stumble upon. Okay. The, now, now the point that Iran just made in the chat. Yeah. Is that the reverse sum of this comes to 126. Okay. But before we 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 tackle William's question uh Hebrew 1725 dahar a primitive root to curvet or move irregularly to prance now were the the way that the lessons and the presentations presented by Parminder and Tess, were they not very irregular according to the way that we've come to understand the, the manner in which we are to study scripture? Yeah, the problem that I have here is I still think that, that these prancings refer to our lines, the chronology that I presented. I don't know that I would do that. So, so one is uh, the number seventeen twenty six. Um, it's two times eight thirty six. Now eight thirty six is uh, or eight thirty six eight sixty three. The number eight sixty sixty three is the hundred and fiftieth prime number. Um, the sum of the divisors is two five nine two, and that's one tenth of a Hebrew day based upon uh, the number of parts of a day. Being twenty five thousand nine hundred and twenty. So, um, so I think you know that's kind of interesting. We also have, um, if we take seventeen twenty five, um, that one doesn't have uh, the octal is three two seven five, but um, I don't see anything particular about that number that jumps out at me. Um, so it's kind of sticking with the the prancings as the number given to us. Can I and, ask a question? Yeah. The mighty one that you had in that verse on mm -hmm. Judges, why does it stick them both together and not separate? Uh, I don't know what you mean. Well, they give one, they give one Hebrew, is that the Hebrew poet? 47. Yeah, yeah. 47. Are there mighty Hebrew. ones? Why, why is there four words in English and one in Hebrew? No, why Why is it Why is it they um, stick mighty one together and not put a Hebrew number beside mighty? Because the, the Hebrew word itself is plural. Right? So it's ab, abiron. It has the a plural at the end. So that means you have to translate it as mighty ones in English. I mean, you could put mighties, but mighties would be kind of uh, not really proper English of their mighties, right? So you say mighty ones. And then it's it's got a form that shows their mighty ones, not the mighty ones. So it okay. shows that it belongs to them, right? Okay. So, so it just says it's the prancings, it's their prancings by means of their prancings, um, but the, the prancings of their mighty ones. So I still don't understand the sentence. I, I don't know who there is referring to. Is it referring to the mighty ones of the horse hooves, of the riders? Or of the ones that, like, are these the ones riding the horses? 
that are have their horse uh, heels broken, the prancings of their horse heels broken? And what does it really mean uh, that they're broken? So as again, I don't understand the sentence. Okay. Right? I don't know what's being referred to. So that's where I'm having the problem. Just, just the basic structure of this sentence and what it's referring to. Now, well, what does a horse do? Well, it prances, it don't it? What, what does it do when it prances? Well, this isn't really the word prance. This is just the word. Uh, it's just referring to the gait of a horse, not prancing. Prancing is not a very good uh, translation. Because it's not, it's not prancing, it's galloping, right? They're, they're just riding their horses. It's the sound of the pattern of their ho horse hooves. So the sound of the pattern of their horse hooves is broken, um, right? Is it the horse hooves of the mighty ones that the pattern of their prancings is broken? Is that what it's just saying, right? All right. The mighty ones referring to the mighty ones of Sisera, like his his army, or are these mighty ones referring to something else? Well, okay, when when you're focusing on the prancings of their mighty ones, is it possible that this is referring to those that were following Jabin and Sisera? Yeah, that's what I'm trying to understand. Is it the ones that are, is this the enemy's prancings of their mighty ones? That's, that would be the point that I would make because, yeah. in again, in comparing scripture with scripture, if we take the second verse that comes up in looking at Hebrew 47. Yeah, it's going to be... Uh, um, yeah, Job 30. Uh, no, First yeah. Samuel 21, 7. For the Hebrew 47? Yeah, I'm, I've got it open on doing my search using. Oh, chiefest, a chiefest. Right. Okay. But, now, certain men of the servants of Saul was there that they detained before the Lord, and his name was Doeg, an Edomite, the chiefest of the herdmen that belongeth to Saul. So you're going to connect there um, that to the story of Saul. and Right. Because it refers to, refers to then his basically Sisera's main uh, men. Well, I'm doing it for two reasons. Yeah. First, it's Sisera's main men, or, or excuse me, Jabin's main men under Sisera, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's also 1 Samuel 21, 7. Yeah, July 21st. Midnight. Yeah. Which, which we mark... Um, I mean, we marked it as as midnight initially, November 9th. Um, but, you know, when we look at all of these mighty ones, we got uh, valiant, Jeremiah 40, 46, 15. Why are thy valiant men swept away that stood not because the Lord did drive them? Uh, you got um, in, in Psalm 78, 25, though, it refers to Man did eat angels' food, and that's um, angels is is from the same word. Stout-hearted, Psalm seventy-six, verse five: The stout-hearted hearted are spoiled; they have slept their sleep, and none of the men of might have found their hands. Isaiah forty-six twelve: Hearken unto me, ye stout-hearted that are far from righteousness. So it generally refers to people that are enemies, except in that one angel thing. Um, so it's not generally looked upon positively in, in the stories. It's addressed, you know, those that are mighty. Um, he draweth also the mighty with his power. He rises up and no man is sure of his life. So it's usually in 
sometimes in contrast to God, defeating them. Uh, Lord has trodden underfoot all my mighty men in the midst of me. He hath called assembly against me. So, so I would say here that you, you're probably correct that this would refer to um, these prancings are the patterns or the, the study of um, Parminder and Tess, and they are broken by uh, in this battle, right? But see, that's why by the means of the prancings, I don't think makes sense. Um, because they're not broken by means of the pr prancings. Um, in, in the sense of, because the way that I would read it, you know, is that, um, I don't know. It, it, it just doesn't make sense as a sentence to me still. Dwight, was that one uh, First Samuel 20 or 21? First Samuel 21, 7. Yeah, so, so they fought against, uh, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. And they're going to, uh, the river Kaishan is going to sweep them away. So these are the false prophets. And their horse hooves are broken uh, from the prancings, from the prancings of their mighty ones. So to me, this would, um, I mean, this is just, uh, you know, or from the, the galloping of their mighty ones, the galloping. So this this just would refer back to November 9th. And and how Parminder's was message was defeated by the chronology, right? By this message of um, Zebulun and Naphtali. This message from heaven, the stars in their courses fought against Israel. So we have God's lines, understanding of chronology, against Parminder and Tess's structure of what they predicted. And they're defeated there on November 9th. So this then this all refers back to November 9th. It's rehearsing back to that history. So when we get then to Moreau's, um, you know, Kersey, Moreau's, Kersey, uh, uh, Kersey, Ramo said, Moreau said, the angel of the Lord, curse, curse the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty. Right. And here we have a different word for mighty. This is the one that you would find um, in the reference there in Daniel chapter 11, verse 3. Right, it's the same word, Gabor. Um, so what does this tell us then? Because Morose, we, we started looking at Morose. I'm sorry, what verse was that? You had the mighty. Well, uh, uh, Angela had used Daniel 11, verse 3, to refer to the mighty. But that wouldn't be the Hebrew word 47. That would be the Hebrew word 1368. Right. So, um, <clears throat> but when we look at Morose, Morose is the one that does not come to the aid. This is a city that does not come to the aid. Now, so it's only mentioned here. So we aren't given this in the story. We're given it in the song. Right? So we're not told anywhere else about this place. It means a refuge, a place in northern Palestine. Sight unknown. Okay, so Morose does not come to the aid of Barak. And so they're going to be cursed. And Ellen White says a lot about it. 
it's those that don't um, support the work. They're basically idle, right? And so there's this curse then is being placed here. We're saying at December 25th, 2021. And, and my, my point was that um, people should have spoken up in support of what I was doing. Colin should have been one of them. But people didn't do that. Right. That, that, that's my perspective on that from what I've read about Moreau's in the spirit of prophecy. Right. So in the spirit of prophecy, she mentions Moreau's 54 times. There's a class that are represented by Moreau's missionary spirit has never taken hold of their souls. Um, and you can just look at uh, tons of statements. The curse of God rested upon them for what they had not done. They had loved the work which would bring the <laughs> prophet in this life. And opposite their names in the ledger devoted to good works, there was a mournful blank. Um, you'll never be ministers after the gospel order till you show a decided interest in the medical missionary work, the gospel of healing and blessing and strengthening. Come up to the help of the Lord, to the help of the Lord against the mighty powers of darkness, that it be not said of you, curse ye morose, curse ye bitterly, uh, the inhabitants thereof, because they came not to the help of the Lord. Uh, there's a class represented by Moreau's. The missionary spirit has never taken hold of their souls. Um, uh, if you were if you were to take a look at the Review and Herald, 26th of November of 1914, paragraph 17, and it reads this way. Many of our missionary enterprises are crippled because there are so many who refuse to enter the doors of usefulness that are plainly open before them. Let all who believe the truth go to work. Do the work that lies nearest you. Do anything, however humble, rather than be like the men of Moreau's. Do nothings. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So this, to me, characterizes... All kinds of things, the Laodicean attitude, as Angela says, pleasure seeking. Um, right. So there's there's a work to be done. And are we going to do it? And 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 part of this would be, of course, personal study. But but this encompasses quite a few things. This this curse of morose, or morose, right? So it's, uh, she says in the next paragraph there in Review and Herald, we shall not be stinted for means if we only go forward trusting in God. The Lord is willing to do a great work for all those who truly believe in him. If the lay members of the church will arouse to do their work in a quiet way, going a warfare at their own charges, each seeking how much he can do in winning souls to Jesus. We shall see many leaving the ranks of Satan to stand under the banner of Christ. If our people will act upon the light that is here given, showing that they sincerely believe the truth which they profess, wonderful revivals will follow. We shall surely see the salvation of God. Sinners will be converted and many souls will be added to the church. When we shall bring our hearts into unity with Christ and our lives into harmony with his work, the spirit that descended on the day of Pentecost will fall on us. So, you know, we talk about the latter rain and we know that uh, on the day of Pentecost, they first were in the upper room. Right. Which is something that we've seen in studying these lines. So. So again, this brings us to this conflict, this darkness then, if we're going to look at these lines and the message that 
arrives on December 25th, 2021, is the message about Moreau's to a large degree, right? Yes. Yeah. And so, so when we put together a line, we, we have to see whether we can find a formalization of this and an empowerment of this. And then we have a second message that arrives, right? And again, we have to see this from these verses that we're studying. <clears throat> So the, the difficulty here is that we're, we are tied up in this history presently. I mean, we're, we're caught in this, uh, this narrative and we have to decide which side we're on. And it's easy to think that we're on the right side of things. I mean, that's human nature. You know, we can't get in by other people's coattails. We have work to do. And we have to know what that work is and, and we have to be organized, not, not in the sense of an official organization or anything, but we have to be able to work together. We have to, we have to have a common goal, a message, and we have to work to deliver that message. And, and that's part of the problem I see with December 25th, 2021 is, you know, I see it as a, uh, the message that's given there by Colin, to be to be honest, as a peace and safety message. And and some people would have a problem with that because he's saying, well, we have this crisis coming. So why do I say it's a peace and safety message? Because it's the type of message that keeps people's view on man rather than on God. Yes. So, so that's definitely part of it. We can see that our view is on man and not God, but there is nothing that we have to do really. Right? We're just going to wait. Agreed. Right now, Rand says the focus is shifted to other people. That's true. So we look at all the problems out there, the church, the world, whoever we don't like, they're all the problem. And and what, what we have to do is we just say, well, we have the right message. You know, we've been given extra light and, you know, Trump's going to become president and the Sunday law is going to come and all this. But there is there's nothing that's that's calling us to action. And, and we don't really need to do anything. We're just going to wait. You know, we're going to wait and see. Time will tell. And, and we're not addressing the problems that exist in this movement. We're not saying with that message. We're not saying, how are we going to work together? What is this message? How are we going to present it? Um, there doesn't seem to be a struggle in that sense. Um, it's, from my view, it's sensational. And, and it's of the same spirit that we had prior to July 18th. Even though there's this idea, well, we're not looking to be vindicated. I think that that is what we're looking for. We want, we want the easy way, the lazy man's way. It, it, to me, it's like buying a lottery ticket. That's the way I look at it. Right? If it happens, we win the lottery. 
everything's going to be smooth sailing, right? I mean, you can give lip service to the idea of this cross, but if you're not taking up the cross now, you're not going to take it up then. I don't know. Am I being too harsh? No. You're being realistic. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't think, see that all at all. I don't, I don't think you are being harsh. Okay. Now, this applies to us as much as to anyone else, right? I mean, by us, the people here in the study right now. I mean, there's a lot that has to be done. And, and we're not looking for some quick fix to any problem. I mean, all I see ahead of me is laborious work, right? That is, there's a lot of work that I have to do, a lot of work that this movement has to do. And in order to do this, we're going to have to work together, right? We, we have to have a common goal. We have to see that our energies, our means and everything need to be placed in a specific direction. Now, for now, in some ways, we're, we're stuck in, in a holding pattern, not by our choice, though maybe our, our actions have, could witness against us in this regard. But um, sometimes I feel like it's just that the movement can't move forward until we address the problems that exist in the movement. And so in that sense, that's why I say like we're in a holding pattern. Um, but that's not where we want to be. And, and we need to recognize that, that we're in this situation. Um, and that's why, you know, I've taken action. Can you call this a tarrying time? Well, it is a tarrying time. Um, but, you know, like we've taken action. We've, we've tried to, to say we need an opportunity to meet together, right? We need to see each other's faces. The things that we've said in private about each other, we need to say to each other individually, right? We need to make confession for our sins, for our harsh words, for our um, evil surmisings, our participation in gossip and all those things. They, they all need to be addressed. And if we can't do that, God can't use us. Well, we, if we can do this and, and these things aren't accepted. How what how would you think God feel that these would be acceptable? Because we've we've went through those motions and they weren't accepted. Mm -hmm. Get you. I mean, it's just something to reflect on. Yeah. So my question again, I want to ask this: Does it seem? Can we call this a tarrying time? And, and the next question I want to ask is, what are some of the numbers we associate with tarrying? I'm being actually a little misleading. I, I, I want us to be a little more specific. What number do we use for tarrying? 9 11. Three? Does that sound familiar? Well, the three days. Yeah. 9 11. Can, can days mean years? Well, they can. Okay, but. so um, I'm just follow me here. How long has it been since July 18th? Well, come camp meeting. Yeah, but but here come yeah. camp meeting. Yeah, but that's that's yeah. three years. But but I I don't think I would make okay. that. Okay, I'm just point. trying to point these things out. You don't have to accept them. Just yeah. you know, I'm see just saying, them. I'm just saying it's a separate line. Right. So if you talk about the tearing after July 18th, I think there's a tearing after December 25th, 2021. That is, uh, I agree. That is, this is actually the end of our line. Right. I mean, we should never say, because uh, if we're going to say that July 18th is October 22, I mean, it typifies it to some degree. But July 18th is Samuel Snow's last letter. Right. 
Yes. You're typifying the disappointment and we're typifying something that's going to happen. So our July 18th is Samuel Snow's July 18th, typifying the disappointment. But we know that we already had the three days applied, right, in the call to repentance to separate from the strange wives. That's December 25th. It's the 20th day of the ninth month. And so we applied the three days from Ezra 10 to that point. And then we have the divorcement. So the divorcement is, it's going to happen um, starting on the first day of the 10th month. So it's going to happen 10 days later, right? And then you have uh, the 88 days of the divorcement. So when we look at December 25th, 2021, I mean, just to look at this line that's in front of you, um, this has to be January 11th, 2023, right? That's where the second angel arrives. And we have this message here. Um, you know, this is the message that arrives and our way marks here that are a formalization of this message and an empowerment of this message. Um, so when we get to January 11th, 2023, uh, this is a message then that, that we are in now. We're actually in this second message. And so the tarrying time is here. That's already passed, right? If we're going to compare it to Millerite history, um, you know, it depends on which way you're looking at it. So, so I know it's a lot rather involved, but um, that's how I'm looking at it at this present time. So we have a formalization, then we have an empowerment. This empowerment I put as November 24th. 2022, right? That's where we're going to have the 2688 show up, right? <clears throat> so anyway, we have to stop here because we went way over time. Okay, well, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning. Bring us together again according to thy will to study your word. Thank you for each person. Help us, Lord, to see our need of you, to see our sins and not the sins of others, to uphold each other in prayer, those that we even consider to be our enemies. As we pray for them, Lord. Help us to know how to win them to you. Uh, thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen.